are card producers fumbling their new releases with overprinting and quality control issues? We'll debate the grisly details in today's Cards on the Table. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome back to another Cards on the Table. Gentlemen, Teapot, Doug, this is our last one of these for a little while because I'm heading to the West Coast. I'm going to LA. Yeah, you're leaving us. It's, it's okay. The viewers are going to like this because for the next five weeks on the Sports Card Investor channel, we're doing specials throughout all five weeks about the West Coast card scene. We're covering the card scene from all of the card shops, all of the card shows, and many of the big collectors out in Los Angeles and California. So I'm excited about that, but it means you guys get a little bit of time off while this show takes a small hiatus. But we are going to kill it today with our final episode for a little while because we got some big topics to talk about, including the recent release of Prism Football, the recent release of Topps Chrome Soccer, UEFA Topps Chrome Soccer. And Doug, are these signs, are there signs, are there bad things happening that are giving you concern? I think there are many people right now who are looking at these releases and saying, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, so particularly with uh, the Panini side of things. So Prism Football just came out. We're talking about the flagship Chromium football product and I saw something I'm not used to seeing. It sat on Panini's website, not just for five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour. It was there all day. That's never the case. That's, that's usually an instant sellout. Uh, and that's, that's pretty telling. So they've upped the checklist, 440 cards. You count in all of the different parallels and inserts. There's over 20,000 cards in this checklist that you can get. Um, they've tried so hard to expand this checklist and force that extra print run. You've got names like Brock Lesnar and Rex Ryan on this. Rex Ryan. It's, it's completely pointless that, that they've added all these names. And it's obvious they've done it just to pump out as much as they can. Uh, we've kind of talked about the, the production delay for Prism. Um, they've talked about supply chain issues and things of that nature. Maybe there wouldn't be so much supply chain issue if you weren't maximizing your print run. You, you go back to what has worked for you in the past, and you probably would have got it out a little bit earlier. Uh, and not to mention the quality control. If you're printing that many cards, how can you make sure that your quality is up to your standard? Um, you know, we talked about Tops and the, the Champions League product. They've done that to an extent. They've doubled their checklist. Normally, that's been a 100-card checklist, which I've always loved. It's 200 cards now. They've doubled their print run on that. But uh, they're, at least their prices have stayed reasonable. You can go right now on MidwestCards.com and you can grab a hobby box for $275 or a light for $125. So at least it's affordable. If you're going to you know, water down the checklist or jack up that print run, make it affordable. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it, it is amazing that we're sitting here in June yeah. talking about Prism football just releasing yeah. from this last season. You know, we're talking about rookie cards of players who we already saw play and they're now starting to report to camp for their second season and their rookie cards are coming out. Do the manufacturers take the blame for this teapot? Are they just screwing the pooch right now? Or what's your perspective? Hey, I mean, somebody has got to take the blame, right? And to be fair, if we were to put ourselves in their shoes and their seats and try to do this and execute, we just we know there are so many challenges behind the scenes that they must be facing every day, right? I try to be a little more balanced. I've got a lot of background personally in supply chain and distribution, and I know what challenges can come up and what kind of interruptions. Doug made some great points, though. If you're going to like raise the print runs and everything, and then on top of it, we keep seeing all these new random one-off products that nobody yeah, cares about right. that have no vetted interest into the marketplace. People, You don't even really know what the product's supposed to be. We saw Flux last year and all these things that they launch into Chronicles and then make recon. into a full-blown product recon. Stop focusing on those and focus on your flagship product, on, your, on the thing that you do well, right? I'm personally really worried about the secondary market effect of, this, of these rollouts. And you hit on print runs, 24,000 total different cards with the variations. And that's estimated. wild. And that's, 24,000 yeah. card checklist. Yeah, and then, of course, there's yeah. hundreds, thousands, tens yeah. of thousands, possibly yeah. hundred, yeah. hundreds of thousands of every single one 
of those 24,000 right. right. cards printed. Do right. the multiples yeah. on that. Yeah. There are millions yeah. and millions and millions and millions and so upon what's millions happen? of prison football cards out there. Yeah, and what's going to happen to these players' prices? To Mac, yeah. Even if Mac Jones, who you know I'm not particularly high on, even if Mac Jones goes on to be a, a recurring Pro Bowl quarterback, he's got so many bloody rookie cards in existence that you can't even figure out like what it should be worth. Now, I did an analysis a while back on a data dive, and I showed that Gary Payton, 10 rookie cards total. That's it. Oh, wow. Kobe, 101. And 96 was the year yeah. things took off. LeBron has 486. Zion Williamson, ironically, 2019 different rookie cards in existence. And but it's only will, going up. This will it's be totally an iconic card for Mac Jones because the photo is him handing off yeah. instead of throwing a pass. <laughs> so the perfect photo for Mac in that, Love it. in that regard. Perhaps fitting. Yeah, you know, the only, the only, the pass that I'll give the manufacturers as well, I mean, obviously they've been dealing with supply chain issues with COVID and all that kind of stuff, but they also probably planned this product and they probably planned those print runs. Yeah. My guess would be over a year Certainly, ago, yeah. back when the sports card market was a lot more frothy than it is today. Things have cooled off, things have changed. So they probably planned bigger print run, bigger production on the basis of the sports card market is going to be even crazier today than it was a year ago. The opposite has happened. Things have yeah. cooled. They come out with a product with huge print runs. It sits on their website unsold for several days before it finally sells out. Interesting times. Obviously, we've got new leadership with Fanatics that is now in control of Tops, and in the future will be in control of you know basketball and football as well. I'm hoping that they are able to figure some of this stuff out over time. Transparency around print runs. I'm confident they're going to do it. I'm confident. A lot of this stuff will get corrected over time, but it's going to take them some time to make an impact. All right, hopefully it doesn't get too crazy between now and then. All right, well, let's talk about our second topic, and this is all about trending and who is trending. This goes back to your Data Dive episode on the Market Movers YouTube channel this past Sunday. It was an interesting one, or this past Saturday, I believe it came out, where you took Google Trends and you looked at, at Google search data around different players and then and then looked at when there were peaks in Google search interest yep. and then drew some correlation to card prices. Yep. I thought there was so give give everyone a little look into what you did and then I a couple of observations that I took away in particular I want to talk about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm always looking for other data sources to marry up to our, you know, market movers data to see if there's other ways you can spot trends and figure out what something's going to do in terms of its price, right? So Google has this great trend feature that'll show you like a relative interest of a player or a search term over time. So I started out showing Jason Tatum and Donovan Mitchell and what had happened with their popularity. And they had these moments where they both went up in their playoff you know, hype in the bubble and other times. And then obviously most recently, we see Donovan Mitchell do this yeah. and we see Jason Tatum do this and hit his highest point, his highest trend point by far since he came into the league as a rookie. And what that told me as I matched this up to data for other players where similar things had happened is do not buy Jason Tatum cards right now because these <laughs> Google trend spikes are truly, like in many cases, they're one-week trends that do this sharp thing and then they literally fall exactly off. What I was and out. that's what's happening with Tatum. That's what will happen. All the eyes are on him. And he didn't have a good game one. I mean, so far, Jalen Brown's the one kind of playing well in this series would be the MVP through two games if the Celtics won. So... I think you're kind of looking at that data and saying like, how do I make sure I'm not going to actually buy at the high point? And that trend data obviously corresponds more to overall interest in a player, which then can correspond to demand for their cards. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we've seen this in the past. Even the players who win the Super Bowl, who win the fight, even if Tatum goes on, Celtics win this thing somehow. He wins the MVP trophy, uh, you know, most valuable for the finals. Uh, it's his prices are still likely to fall. Yeah. And you, in your video, you said, you know- They you might know, stabilize. Of, yeah, we're not totally sure where they would go from here, but what we do know is we've seen even a player like Patrick Mahomes in football a couple of years ago, he wins the Super Bowl, he is MVP, his prices drop in the weeks following the Super Bowl. Like that, that you know, that it, it is truly when that player peaks in the news cycle, when they're trending the hardest, yeah is when their card prices are going to rise. Yeah. It's the, what's, what's the saying? Buy the, uh, buy, the, buy the rumor, don't buy the news, there right? Go, buy yeah. the rumor, sell the news, right? right. And that's truly, that's truly the case. Buy the rumor, sell the news. It, that's, that's how the sports card market seems to work. No, you're 100% right. And that's something I noticed when I started looking into this is when it comes to uh, card spikes or just even sales volume based on headlines, it's very short term in most cases, unless it's a really big 
headline. Um, you know, something like a, a season ending, ending injury or something along those lines. But when it comes to things like uh, coaching rumors, trade rumors, new teammate, uh, things of those natures, that, 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 that's pretty up and down. Those new cycles last a week or less a lot of times. Um, certain things are pretty good to look out for, though. Uh, one of the things that I've capitalized on recently was Weston McKinney has been injured for a while, U.S. men's national team soccer player, midfielder. Uh, he posted on his Instagram him training and working out. And I was like, all right, Weston's back. And sure enough, you would see that spike. I think he even made our top five shortly after that. I, I know Ben reached out to me. He was like, why is uh, Weston McKinney trending right now? I was like, he's back, baby. You know, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where certain positive headlines, you know, everybody's looking for some positivity. Those will kind of maintain a little bit more of a, of a positive spike without the immediate drop off. But again, you know, that's not something that I typically gravitate to as headlines just because it's just so up and down and you've really got to be ahead of the game a little bit on that. Again, you've got to be ready for the rumor yeah. and you've got to be able to ready to get out of it when yeah. the news actually happens. I used it more as a preventative yeah. to, to just go, do not buy now and maybe sell now. Well, all the stuff the that other you showed around, in, the, right? in the data dive video, all the yeah. biggest spikes were negative. Yeah. yeah, that's right. A lot of news cycles, a lot of negativity, yeah. passing of you know athletes, Kobe, sure. Tiger's rollover accident, all those things were the high, high yeah. points. Now I will say today I compared Tatum to LeBron to see how does Tatum, now that he's hit his high point, compare to what LeBron's stuff has done in the last five years? No surprise, LeBron's much, much, much higher. But what's interesting is right now, right now, LeBron is at his lowest interest point in the last five years. Wow. And Tatum's at his highest and has just eked above LeBron. So to me, I'm looking at that going, if this is the lowest, this is the, this is the moment when the eyes have been the least on LeBron, I'm probably looking at his cards yeah. to see what's going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that was one of my big takeaways from your video was actually when you were comparing Tatum and you were comparing Mitchell, and then all of a sudden you decided to put Tiger Woods on the graph. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the interest levels in Tiger Woods from a search standpoint were so much higher than the two of them that it rendered them almost invisible on the graph. It was like they're meaningless. Tatum and Mitchell are meaningless compared to Tiger Woods. Same with Tom Brady when you put Tom Brady on the graph. And to me, that was like, wow, a clear indicator of no matter what Tatum does this postseason, would I rather be hold, holding some Tatum cards? Would I rather be going buying some Tiger Woods cards right now? By the way, Tiger Woods cards or LeBron, Tiger Woods cards have come down considerably in the market over the course of this year. They're much more affordable now. They've hit some low points in, in over the last couple of years right now. You know, his like sign 2001, yeah, SP, SP uh, those types of cards, they are, are much more affordable to pick up today than they were any time in the last couple of years. Might be a good time to look at that. Speaking of a good time to look at sports cards, it is a good time every single day to look at sports cards in the free Sports Card Investor app. Inside that Sports Card Investor app, we've got some really awesome new features thanks to you and your product team, Teapot, such as the ability to filter by sport, by era, by, by you can search by player, you can search for any card. Right there on the main screen, there's now new filtering capability added. You can even filter by price. So whether you're looking just at high-end cards or whether, whether you're looking for value cards you can pick up for 10 bucks, it's all at your fingertips in the free Sports Card Investor app. All right, guys, let's talk about our new topic, which is, you know, it seems like every week we come on the show and there's some type of grading company news. Every week. Here we are again. PSA has reopened their value service. $30 a card now for cards under $499 in value. If you're going to submit direct to PSA, you have to be a member of their collector's club, which costs you $99 per year. There is a free workaround for that. Just submit through us. If you go to sportscardinvestor.com slash grading, you can submit your cards. Again, $30 per card, minimum 10 cards, PSA value service. You don't have to pay $99 to join their collector's club. 
That's sportscardinvestor.com slash grading. Tell us, Doug, I know you submit a lot of cards for grading. Yeah. What does this mean to you? How is this causing you to change your game, your thought process when it comes to grading? Yeah, there's a lot of things I could talk about on here, so I'll try to make it quick. But um, first of all, what about the timing of this news? Right after BGS comes back with uh, $25 and $35 options with the same turnaround time, and right after CSG announces a small price hike, uh, PSA is like, we're back with uh, value, right? Um, initially, when the news first came out, it only came out through the group subs, right? The PSA didn't tell us anything, but all the big group submitters were saying, hey, it's back, it's back, value's back. And I was bummed out because it's only a few months ago that I paid for a collector's club membership to get economy access, and now it's, it, this is being given out to group subs, but not to me. Um, of course, PSA you know, made an announcement shortly thereafter, and everything's great. Um, one thing that I really like uh, about that is that they said they're going to clear out the backlog first mm -hmm. for 2021 value before even shipping out 2022 value. But what kind of new backlog are they going to create in that period of time? Because I know a ton of people that are ready to just flood yeah. PSA yeah. with me that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. I'm, 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 I've got a whole stack of things. When I was waiting for this level to come down to this point, 30 bucks a card, let's go. And I will say you mentioned uh, you're talking when we were talking about Prism earlier and wax prices, singles yeah. prices, and all of that. This does help wax prices and singles prices when you can grade more cards yeah. uh, at, a, at a lower price yeah. point. Yeah, I think it's a bit potentially a bit of a sh it's a short term boost for sure, because people look at it and they go, oh, I can recapture some of my value by ripping to send it in to get it graded to get the multiplier and whatever. But I worry about the long term situation with those twenty four thousand different variations now getting slabbed. Yeah and adding to this junk slab era that Hammer just did a great Hammer Time video yeah. on, talking about how everything is now slabbed. Obviously, we're not opposed to grading. Obviously, there's, there's a real value to it. There's a reason we do it, many reasons. But what we've seen now is there are so many cards selling for, there's PSA 10s now out there selling for a buck yeah. of certain players, you know, much less than what they used to go for. So there's this eventual like weakening of the whole pool of these cards. Graded cards, if you're really a collector, a volume collector, graded cards take up more space. They're heavier to carry around. So it's like some of these like tops flagship cards or like prism base cards of second and third round draft picks, you're like, I'm going to get this graded. By the time I get it back, like all of this interest just might have totally yeah. waned on these players. So that's, that's always what's going through my head with these grading submissions. I'm glad it's down to 30 bucks. I'll be using it for sure. 100%. But I do worry about the long-term effect of what it does to the overall market. And I'm curious, for those of you watching, have you been sitting on cards that you have been waiting to grade until PSA came down to this lower price level? Are you currently assembling a big grading order? Let us know in the comments below if you are or if you aren't. I'm curious to get that sense from the audience. And of course, if you are, once again, consider using our grading service to save the most money, sportscardinvestor.com, grading in the main menu bar. Okay, final topic today suggested by one of our viewers, one of our mailbag topics is around uh, patches, patches in cards. And you know, one of the big complaints that a lot of sports card collectors have had over the last couple of years, particularly with Panini, is they have gone away, I mean, we've gone way away from game-worn patches. Like, you're not really seeing, game-worn stuff is like, that feels like a little bit of a thing of yesteryear. Even player-worn, you know, and player-worn was kind of a, a cheap cop-out for game-worn, because player-worn was basically, Panini shows up at a signing day with a stack of jerseys, the player takes it on, takes it off, takes it on, takes it off, takes it on, and now you've got a bunch of player-worn jerseys. But they've gone away from player-worn in some cases to, to, you know, things like this piece of memorabilia is not associated with any specific player or event, yeah. not even just like literally off the shelf of, you know, a, yeah. a Walmart store yeah. or ordered online from fanatics perhaps. Yeah. Right. And then cut up and put yeah. into cards. Yeah. Where is this going? Is fanatics going to be able to get this fixed? Where would you like to see this go teapot? It all goes back again to the list of, Requests we have for Fanatics, the episode we did, and this was one of the big ones. And it, this was the one of the ones that got a lot of the comments in the comments feed of that video. It's like, people don't want it, right? It's not mm -hmm. a hit. It is not a not hit. When you open, especially a premium product, a high-end product, you just open Noir, there's other things. Now, the Noir veteran stuff, a lot of that is game-worn. The rookies, of course, are not from any specific thing. Those aren't hits. 
it's, I'd, I'd rather have a parallel. I'd rather have a, a creative insert. I'd rather, I'd rather have a sticker auto than a non-player worn oh, whatever yeah. of, uh, of some piece of hat that got cut up. I'd rather have a commemorative patch that doesn't pretend to be anything associated with the player, but maybe looks kind of cool in the card than the non whatever, whatever. So it's, it's almost like at the absolute bottom rung of what anybody cares about other than maybe people who don't, who just don't quite understand like what that means when you're just giving, getting back into things. Maybe you don't know what that means. I just think they need to do away with it. Make it more limited again, figure out how to use other, create other creative cards and do other things and maybe create more like in-game experience redemptions for cards rather than putting that type of stuff in there. And I think we'll see a lot more of that. I, I think Fanatics and Josh Luber and others there know this isn't something that people want. They don't want it. So I think it'll, uh, I think it'll get fixed. Hopefully so. What do you think? Are you optimistic about fixing this? Meh. I mean, yeah, I guess, but it, it, what we need is quality, not quantity, right? And yeah. that's what I'm always afraid of, is that they're not going to make that sacrifice. You know, Event Worn is such a joke, if we're being honest about it. Uh, if you were to go and Google Player Worn Mark Ingram, you're going to see that famous picture that leaked of Mark Ingram wearing like 50 oversized jerseys all at once <laughs> so they could take them off and just cut them up. Uh, there's a nice video that linked of a player going, taking a stack of hats, touching them to his head so that they can say player worn. Literally not putting the hat on, just touching it to his forehead. Uh, th it's just, what's the point? And I don't even care in either of those situations at that right. point. I'm just like, eh, whatever. You and, know? and a lot of times with these jerseys, even if they're not just the plain white napkin, please get rid of the plain white napkin. We never need to see that again, ever. So even if it does have some variation to it, it's not even the player's real jersey. A lot of times, as people have learned, they use the number 88 when they're doing this because that gives you the most surface area to cut off these like multicolored patches. So it's not, I mean, it's just so arbitrary and, and so pointless. Give me less, but make it better. Yeah, and what's interesting is there's actually been a surge in interest around game-worn memorabilia as a result of the card manufacturers going much more away from it in recent yeah. years. You're yeah. seeing older game-worn cards get a lot of interest, and you're seeing record prices set in auctions, like golden auctions, record prices for game-worn complete jerseys, not cards. Yeah. It seems to be kind of getting a surge in popularity, and maybe some of that's caused we, We've seen how big chase cards yeah. that are super hard to hit can drive the value of a product way up, yeah. especially years later. This is kind of like a Chinese finger trap, right? You pull this way and it's stuck. Yeah. You push counterintuitively this way, pare it down like Doug said, quality, mm -hmm. make it game worn and super hard to hit. And, and then, then if you hit it. when everybody wants the product, everyone, they're gonna rip it. Because everyone loves to gamble. Yes. And if you're gonna gamble, yeah. you want the yeah. shot at the really big jackpot. Yeah. That's take, right. take and one if there's not a really big jackpot, right, then you're not, you don't care as much about it. You know, that's why people play mega bucks. That's why <laughs> that's, that's why in Vegas, matter of fact, the I gotta top go of buy every one. every slot, every machine's gotta have the progressive with a giant $10 million number that you have no chance of hitting, but you gotta have that because that's what pulls people in. Yeah. Take what Tops does. You, I'm not a huge baseball guy, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Some of their stuff has like a way to track where yeah. the memorabilia came from. You That's can right. see the exact game it's from. Yep. That means something to me. Yeah. A lot more than just a plain cool. white napkin that I know the player probably never even touched. 100%. All right, we're out of time today. If you enjoyed this episode, three things I want you to do right now. First thing, give this a like. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Second thing, go to the App Store on your phone and download the Sports Card Investor app. If you already have it, open it up. Lots of great stuff in there, including new filtering options. Third thing, what was the third thing? I can't even remember the third thing. Yeah. Cards, my mind uh, is in, my mind is <laughs> in LA. Episodes. My mind is in LA. I'm already halfway out the yeah. door. Yeah. I can't even remember what I was gonna tell you guys the third thing was today. Third I don't thing, know. Send him a DM. I don't know. Get raises, you know, sure. all that. Sure. <laughs> tell friends about the show, you know. Yeah, like, whatever. subscribe, hit the bell icon. We already did that, anyway. Yeah. Look, guys, really excited to head to L.A., bring you guys great content from the world of the West Coast card scene. I'll miss you guys. We're going to miss you. I'm you the sports card yep. investor now. All right. Good night, everybody.